Okay, my name is Bob Maynard. I'm the uh, prison and jail monitor for the John Howard Association. Um, I live in Chicago. I inspect prisons for a living. The John Howard Association is named after an English prison reformer from the um, 18th century. He's sort of the father of prison reform. And John Howard Association um, was organized here in Illinois in 1901. And it's been inspecting prisons, jails, juvenile facilities ever since. Um, we're not lawyers, although we've got a room full of them. We don't represent people. Um, we represent the interests of people in prison and the interests of society. What we do is go to the prisons and um, basically inspect them. And I look at everything, um, sanitation in the kitchen, uh, the quality of mental health care, uh, how crowded is the prison, um, is it safe, um, is there, are there educational opportunities. Um, then after that, which takes all day, and I take a group of volunteers with me to help, then we prepare a report, written report. And it goes to the, the governor and the head of the Department of Corrections and a couple of thousand other people who are interested in, in prison issues. And then periodically, the association um, also we'll do a special report on something. Uh, most recently we did one on education and the fact that higher education is being abolished in the prison system. Um, we're a small outfit here. We've only got uh, three staff people. Um, one of my colleagues um, um, does juvenile justice. I do only adult, um, uh, adult justice. So that's pretty much what John Howard Association is. Okay, what you've got here is um, 27 prisons in Illinois, actually 28, but one is not occupied. Uh, it contains about 45,000 individuals. They were designed to hold 33,000. So, as you can tell, they're grossly overcrowded. Uh, the prison system now, because of the very lengthy sentences given out and the end of an early release program that was controversial, are grossly overcrowded. They're beginning to uh, bunk people in um, you know, gyms and infirmaries and other places where you ordinarily would not have a person living. Um, there is no solution to this problem that I know of, certainly no political solution on the horizon. It's simply going to get worse. Every week sets a new record in the prison population in Illinois. And that is the principal problem that, this, that the prison system faces. There's too many people in prison that don't belong there, okay? Twenty percent of the population in prison in this state is there for marijuana, okay? At the end of last year, we had 63 people in prison for disturbing the peace. Now, how do you go to prison for disturbing the peace, okay? We've got people in prison for vehicle code violations, not drunk driving. It's just something was wrong with your car, and you got a prison sentence for it, okay? Um, there are wide disparities in sentencing in this state. Um, for example, in Chicago, if you get caught with 72 Valium in your uh, pocket and no prescription for them, you probably get probation, okay? It's no big deal. Uh, if, if you get caught in a rural county down south, you may get three years in state custody for that same 72 Valium without a prescription. Um, this leads to some incongruities in sentencing. Uh, third time drunk driver here, you might get, say, a year in state prison. You might get three, okay? Um, then there's the social perception of what should be done with adult inmates, okay? Typically people want to deny them education. Um, they want them to, to be as uncomfortable as possible and they want them to be gone for as long as possible. Now, these are three ways to guarantee that someone's going to reoffend. okay? No education, ill treatment, long time in, in confinement. They come out and 93% of the people who go to prison come back out again, okay? If they don't come out better, they're gonna come out worse. 
Uh, which do you prefer? Well, it, it really wasn't very intricate. Uh, it was actually pretty simple. Since the 1970s, um, the Department of Corrections has had an early release program of one sort or another, and typically it'd knock about a month or two off your sentence, okay? And remember, most sentences are for less than a year. More than half of people get out of prison in nine months or less. So then would knock off a month, and it was done to hold down the prison population. This became a political issue at the uh, end of last year. Um, the Republican candidate for governor um, accused uh, Pat Quinn, the uh, governor, of being soft on crime. Um, eventually Quinn banned the early release program. Uh, the legislature acted to restrict it. We don't have it anymore. The results were completely predictable. Every week there's more people in prison than the week before. This early release program on average was letting people out 37 days early. Now, how much is a person going to change by spending an extra 37 days in prison? They're not going to change at all. There's no educational program, there's no rehabilitation, nothing's going to occur. They're going to sit there for an extra 37 days. But it does cause the prison system to become grossly overcrowded very quickly. Um, I don't know if they'll ever come back with an early release program. And this was a compromise proposal after they had tried to close prisons since since Blagojevich's time? Oh, it, it had been a tool used by prison um, officials to, to manage uh, prison population for, for, as I said, since the 70s. It, it was just sort of a, a fact. It was just, had always been done this way. There was no, no law against it, no law authorizing it. It was just up to the Department of Corrections to try and keep their prisons you know, population uh, to a reasonable number. Um, after it became a political issue, it disappeared. Um, it's very expensive. I've seen estimates of $75 million a year um, to keep people in prison, on average, an extra 37 days. Um, and this is, comes uh, in a verbal context. Uh, this announcement that, and this plan that Governor Quinn tried to roll out <coughs> was um, going on at the same time that the district court out in the 6th district, I believe, told uh, California yes. Department of Corrections they had to release 40,000 inmates, and Michigan was told to release 9,000, I think. Something like that. Um, and I think only Michigan let people out. Well, California well, still, they appealed it to the Supreme Court. It's still, like, going mm -hmm. all the way to the top. Well, nationwide, uh, prison populations have been slowly declining in recent years. Um, and it's, I think, some of the momentum for extremely long sentences for relatively minor crimes um, has abated. And there's more community diversion. People are being treated in the community rather than going to prison for certain offenses, particularly drugs. And that's good. Illinois seems to be going in the wrong direction. And why do you think that is? I mean, is, is it as simple as, you know, the, the old tough on crime, weak on crime political argument? Or? Uh, Willie Horton works. You know, it is a, now granted the Republican who, who attempted, appears to have lost the election, final results aren't in, but he appears that he has lost and that Quinn will be, um, retain the governorship. But it was extremely close. And this is a democratic state. This is a blue state. For it to be a close election for, for governor indicates that the hard on crime, soft on crime debate carries a lot of weight with the public still. Um, it also it didn't help that some of the people who were released early went on to commit new crimes, one or two of them terrible crimes. But this is always going to happen. Like I said, 93% of the people that come out go to prison come back out again. Some of them are going to commit new crimes. That's what it's going to be. What we do is um, I will go with a group of three to eight people, typically volunteers, other staff members, members of the board, 
of directors of John Howard Association. We'll go to a prison in the morning, and what we'll do is go through the mental health unit. And I'll talk with staff there. Mental health um, treatment, psychiatric care, in fact, is a major issue in all the prisons. Okay, estimates vary, but probably about a third of the prison population has a some form of diagnosable mental illness. Um, we'll go through the, um, the, the, the infirmary. Uh, I know in advance, I question the, the wardens in advance as to their staffing, so I know if they're short on doctors or short on psychologists and so forth. While we're there, we'll talk with inmates about how they're being treated. We'll talk with staff about the problems they face. Um, we'll go on to the segregation unit, which is where they put people that violated the rules. Seg units are where the problems live, okay? And often people in segregation are people with psychiatric problems that are uncontrolled, and they are being punished for being ill. Uh, we go into a general population unit, of course, whether it's a cell house or a dormitory. Uh, go through the kitchen. I look for sanitation. I'm big on sanitation. Um, we we talk with the education people to see what kind of programming there is, or if there is any. Uh, one of the prisons has no programming whatsoever that I can find. Um, I interview the warden, um, typically and several other officials within the prison. It takes about a day. Um, Are they friendly? And yeah, it, it's, it's surprising. everybody's surprisingly friendly. Uh, the, the management of the prisons like the fact that we are independent. The director likes it because somebody is, is, who's not a yes man is going to tell him what is actually happening in the prisons. Um, the wardens like it because they can point out problems they've got, and they often do. I was in one prison, and the warden made it a point to show me that the roofs were caving in throughout the prison, and I hadn't noticed it, and she wanted it fixed. and. Uh, and she said, please put this in your report. And I did, of course. Um, without exception, the inmates are, are very happy to see us. Many of them know why we're there, and we explain to those who don't why we are there. Because prison is so boring, it's, it's a break in the day for them. And nobody ever asks an inmate their opinion on anything. And I do. I ask opinions. And and ask them to describe things. And people, inmates are like everybody else. They want to say what they think. A chronic problem in the state is the, is the soy-based diet. Governor Blagojevich, a convicted felon, took a large campaign contribution in the early uh, part of the decade uh, in exchange for switching the diet of prison inmates to one based on soy products. Soy sausage, soy patties, soy cornflakes, soy milk, soy everything, okay? It is the largest dietary experiment in human history. It's also the subject of a federal lawsuit. The inmates hate this stuff. I don't blame them. I tried, I ate one of those meals and will not do it again. I advise people who go with me into the prisons Taste the food, but don't eat it. It's not going to agree with you. Um, and that's the most common complaint I get. The others, the next most common is the absence of medical care. For example, at uh, Dwight Correctional Center, which is the main prison for women, women were complaining that it was going, it was taking four years between dental cleanings. Do you know what your teeth look like after four years without dental hygiene? Okay, they're ready for extraction. Um, medical care is a, is a chronic problem. Um, people won't be treated for hernias, uh, for example, unless it's life-threatening. Well, if you ignore a hernia long enough, it becomes life-threatening, or it can. So wouldn't it make more sense to do the surgery to repair the hernia rather than wait till it's life-threatening and then do the surgery? Um, after that, a lot, of, a lot of the discussion from inmates is that they would like more opportunity for education whether it's learning how to be like a custodian, say, or learning how to be a precision uh, lathe operator, um, or getting their GED. Uh, some of the prisons, you, 
you can be on the waiting list for a GED for five years. But yeah, Wexford Health Services is the main. Right. Uh, they got a no bid contract in 2002, I believe, if my, my memory serves right. And, and then again in 2008, and they're negotiating a contract now. And I looked up, they've got lawsuits in 11 states. and. Well, they were thrown out of New Mexico. They were thrown out of Clark County, Washington. Um, they've been severely criticized in Mississippi. Um, to tell you the truth, though, I have to say, it's, I don't think society is ever going to pay for adequate medical care for, for prison inmates. We don't do it for people on the outside. Why would we do it for people on the inside? They, I know this because the state doesn't pay its bills. Okay, Illinois is, is bankrupt, in case anybody didn't know this, and it doesn't pay its bills, and so they lose their food vendors all the time. You know, somebody else be supplying them with fresh milk, say, for three months or six months, and I get paid, and cuts the state off, so the state finds another vendor to victimize. And some of the prisons, for example, have been through four food vendors, and the wardens are real worried that someday the chow's not going to get delivered at all. And what are you going to do to announce to the inmates, uh, we're not feeding you anymore? I know, it's that bad. That is not an exaggeration. At the end of the inspection, which easily can last five hours or more, uh, we sit with the warden and sort of debrief, and ask questions, they explain. Um, often, as I said, they'll, they'll point out problems we didn't even notice. Um, after that, I, I prepare a, about a 1,500 to 2,000 word report on what I found in the prison. and. We report good things as well as bad. I mean, like one of the prisons, for example, has huge lawns. Uh, they dug them up and turned it into produce, vegetable gardens. Good idea. It gives the inmates something fresh to eat, gives the inmates something to do, and you didn't really need that much yard anyway. You, you know, it's better to have fresh tomatoes. So we'll point out something like that, that, that there's a good practice that the other prisons should, um, should emulate. Um, we don't pull any punches. Can you tell us about some of the bigger changes that you guys have been able to bring about through the work that you do? Yeah, but it's always temporary. I mean, it really is. Actually, what I've noticed where we're most effective is getting small things fixed rather than big ones. And there's a lot of small things that are wrong with the prisons that added up together and make prison nearly intolerable. Um, for example, Dwight, the women's prison, was um, way understaffed on psychiatric uh, and mental health uh, staff. They didn't have enough people. So what was happening is women were going one to three months without their medication. Well, with some of these psychotropic medications, medications to treat mental illness, you don't just stop taking them, okay? And if you do, you can have serious consequences, like psychosis. And People weren't getting their medication. They were being abruptly cut off because there was nobody around to prescribe their medication for them. We pointed that out, and the state, to its credit, fixed it within a week. <sighs> that was last year. I just got back from Dwight, and guess what? <laughs> There's a shortage of psychiatric and mental health staff there. And they're trying, but there's still women who aren't getting their medication on time. Um, I think where we serve the... The role we serve best is that we keep reminding people that they're there. Remember, prisons are for the most part located in remote rural areas. You don't see them. Um, most prisoners never get a visitor. They're not seen, okay? Um, they, they, they have so, because their contact with the real world is, is, is so limited, they're easily forgotten. We try to remind people they exist. And at that, I think we are pretty successful. We're located in a law school here, Northwestern University. And um, like the Central Center on Wrongful Convictions is located here. There's various legal clinics on um, the juvenile justice located here. And we pull together a lot of those people, work with them um, on their issues, when there were their issues in ours to coincide, which is often the case. Um, could we do more? Look, there's three of us, you know? Yeah, we could do a lot more. Um, on the other hand, nobody else does what I do. Is, um, how is uh, John Howard funded? We beg. So mostly philanthropy? Yeah, entirely. Uh, we accept no government money. Um, we do get 
you know, some grants from like foundations for specific projects. We have individual donors who are really kind of our bedrock. Uh, we work cheap. Do you um, do you find that the independence from federal state money um, gives you a certain position of uh, strength or influence? Oh, absolutely. We couldn't accept a dime from the state. It would never. Uh, Were you to take state money, how would the... I would feel utterly... I, we'd, be, we'd be compromised. Yeah. You know, we are not an arm of the government, and we can't be. And uh, there is, to my knowledge, we've never accepted uh, any government money, and certainly we would not do it now. It's out of the question. Okay, let's talk about education. Um, in Illinois, out of any 100 people that come out of prison, 53 of them are going to go back in, okay? Unless they get, and they're involved in an educational program while they're in prison, then only 19 will reoffend and go back to prison. It's a huge difference. Education, since it, probably for 100 years, has been known to deter repeat offenses. People get education, they don't commit crimes. Um, so, in the 1990s, under the Clinton administration, um, the federal government cut off all financial aid for education, um, uh, post-secondary education in prisons. Used to be you could get a bachelor's degree if you wanted, or you could get um, you know, a, a skilled, skilled training uh, in many different fields. Um, and that's largely gone now. There's still some education uh, for GEDs. Um, there's still some vocational education, but not very much. And the waiting lists are so terribly long. Um, welding, for example, used to be taught in 20 prisons in Illinois. Welding is a very good skill. It's fairly easy to get a job to, to, as a welder. Uh, it used to be taught in 20 prisons. It's now taught in one. Okay. Um, my feeling is that every inmate no matter the, how long their sentence is, should have the option to, to pursue education. Um, granted, there's going to be some who could care less, but there's a lot of people who, for whatever reason, would like to advance their education. Um, there's also a real strong indication that people who, even lifers, say, the guy's never going to get out. So the argument you will hear often is, why should he get a, uh, you know, any college? He's, he's not getting out. He's not going to ever be using it. The answer is he becomes a better prisoner. He's less likely to cause problems. There's something about education that changes people's behavior for the better. Um, I have seen no evidence in Illinois or in, really in any other state that there will be a return of education to prisons. At some of the prisons, they have a 12-day program that's supposed to teach you how to live in the real world once you get out. I don't know how you teach that in 12 days. And it is set up so that you will come back. Um, you know, it, it really depends, uh, first of all, on how hard you try to get reentry help and how lucky you are and where you go. You're going to have a lot better luck in Chicago than you are, you know, in, in rural uh, downstate Illinois. And why is that? Other programs are here. There's, you, there's a possibility that you'll you'll get help in finding housing. There's there's a chance that you'll be able to get um, mental health care. Something in a lot of the rural counties, that just doesn't exist. Um, and this is done through organizations like Safer Foundation. Safer Gateway, Heartland, um, many other very good organizations uh, work in, in those fields, and. Um, and they don't get enough support, considering how vital the work is. Um, and just to be clear, uh, there really isn't a commensurate infrastructure that the state offers. There's, you know, these are all private organizations. Yes, I mean the state uh, does uh, offer grants to these organizations, and there's Medicaid and and so forth. But it's they're basically philanthropic organizations. They're not arms of the government. Uh, and there's also not enough of them. The state has uh, adult transition centers, but it's, it's very, which are sort of like a halfway house in effect. Um, 
and they're they're good programs actually, but they're very limited in the number of people they can accept. So it's the crossroads program. Right. Yeah, yeah. and it's uh, they won't take um, uh, most violent offenders, for example. Um, they won't pay, take people with um, certain sentences or repeat uh, offenses or whatever. They're selective in who they take. Um, actually, I think every inmate coming out should be going through an adult transition center, uh, a halfway house, f for at least a, a few months. I mean, what you really don't want is some guy getting a bus ticket and 20 bucks and said, Chicago's over that way, why don't you go home? It's not going to work. It seems to be that there is a kind of a culture, uh, you know, at least in the philanthropic community with you and Safer and Heartland and Gateway and all of that, there is at least a little bit of a core concern um, for, this, for these issues. Uh, why do you think that's developed here and, and it, it hasn't really developed in so many other places? Well, you got to remember, Chicago is in a way the cradle of social activism. Jane Hall, okay, um, the, the, at the turn of the, the, the 20th century, a lot of social concerns and social welfare movements originated in Chicago. Um, John Howard was one of them. Um, why, I'm not sure, although it could be the European influx uh, of, of people to Chicago in the 19th and early part of the 20th century brought ideas here that didn't spread to the other parts of the United States. Um, but that's a good question. I, I'm, I'm not sure I have an answer for it. The most important thing for an inmate coming out is a job right away. That's what they want and they're right. That's what you need first. And, and it, it's hard to get, obviously. A second most important thing that's been pretty well established is family connections. Do you have anybody, any family support? If you don't, your, your job's making it are very poor. Um, the, the long term, we don't really know what the long term effects are going to be of the criminal policies enacted in the 1980s and 1990s. Those people are still in prison. Um, crimes that used to get you three years now get you 30. Okay, what's a person like when they come out, they went into prison when they were, say, 25, and they come out at 55, uh, and they're, they're no better educated than when they went in? What would they be like? We don't really know. The laws, the, 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 the prison sentences have been so extended, have gotten so long, that they haven't gotten out yet. It will be interesting to see what happens when they do start coming out. 93% will. Nationally, it's about 62%. For some reason, Illinois is better. If here, it's about 52% go back within three years. By the way, you can go back without committing really a crime. Uh, you can go back to prison if you're on, um, uh, it's called managed supervised release, um, which means basically you've got a parole agent breathing down your neck. Uh, they find a bottle, an empty bottle of beer in your trash, and they can send you back to prison for it. Have you committed a crime? No, but you're going back to prison for a year or two. Um, but, you know, another way of looking at it is, is okay, Illinois, 52% say go back to prison at some point. Well, it means 48% didn't. 48% didn't do it again. Whether they changed or got smart, I don't know, but they didn't come back. So it's not inevitable. I've had friends, people I've known for many years, tell me I'm out of my mind to do what I do. Um, I was a career journalist, okay, and um, I, most recently with the Chicago Tribune, prior to that the Chicago Sometimes, and um, like half of my colleagues, I got laid off, you know, tri as the Tribune went into bankruptcy, and um, I was bored. Unemployment's boring. First three months was great. After that, it's it really dull. As so I started volunteering here, and, uh, and then job p a position came up, and I, I knew I could do it, and that's why I got hired. Um, I guess my, my interest in, in correctional issues and prisons, I've always, it's always been in the back of my mind, why are they doing it this way? It doesn't make any sense. Why would you take, okay, 66% of the, two-thirds of the people in the Illinois prison come within 50 miles of downtown Chicago, okay? 
why would you locate a prison 350 miles away from, from home, way out in the middle of nowhere? Why would you do that? It makes no sense whatsoever. Well, it does if you, if you regard a prison as an economic asset, which they do, okay? Um, that's not a good reason to locate prisons where they are located. So I was curious about things like that. You know, wh why, why did the Clinton administration basically ban uh, you know, uh, college education for, for um, uh, prison inmates. It just makes no sense what whatsoever. And um, now after having been on the inside, um, I, I, I can't say that any of these things make sense, but I understand why they were done. Well, in the case of education, it was people saying, um, why should uh, I pay for some criminal's education when I have to, I'm struggling to pay for my own kid's education or my own education? Well, the answer to that is so that they won't commit crimes again, okay? Also, I think education is a basic human right, and that alone should be reason enough. Um, the, you know, why should, um, okay, typically a dental care in prison involves extraction. They don't fix anything, they just pull it. People will say, well, why should I pay to, for somebody else to, to get their teeth fixed? Well, because it's the human thing to do, okay? Just drinking somebody's teeth when you, you could fill a cavity, it's the human thing to do. Um, I don't know, there are, there are it's hard to, to reason with people uh, on this issue, or perhaps I'm not good at reasoning with them. Um, I can tell you though, the United States incarcerates a larger percentage of its population than any other country in the world with the possible exception of North Korea, okay? What is it about our society that does this? Why are you 10 times more likely to be in prison in the United States than you are in the Netherlands? It just makes no sense. This is no criticism of the union movement. I was a union, a trade unionist for more than 25 years. But it is true that the correctional un unions have an inordinate amount of power. In California, I believe they are the single largest source of campaign contributions. I know in Illinois, they vote as a block and they vote for their interests. And this, this gives them political clout. Um, I mean, some people refer to it as the prison industrial complex, and, and there's some truth to it. Um, there's a vested interest in locking people up for some elements of society. The, um, I can tell you one good thing is that the idea of privatizing prisons isn't catching on. It's not working, okay? You know, it's, it's not a good business to get into, and the public doesn't like it, and, and I'm glad this should be Imprisonment should be a monopoly of the state. No one else should have the right to do it. Like I say, my guess is 20 to 25 percent of the prison population shouldn't be there. If you subtract everybody who's there for marijuana, and if you subtract the shoplifters, okay, and the petty offenders, you've taken out 25 percent of the population of the prison. But isn't there something to be said about the fact that, for example, in Illinois, Governor Quinn could come out and say, we're going to release only 1,000 low-level petty offenders who are as part of this early release program anyway. And one politician gets up and he says, there will be hordes of criminals roaming the street. I, I, I have often said it's as if they were saying that once they were letting each of these death row inmates out, they were giving them a Google map to your house so they can come and kill you. So. So when this happens, we really have to shift, not blame, but you have to look at the public that is willing to believe this. That when they're told, you know, these are some marijuana smokers or some petty offenders, they don't need to be in there, we're going to let them out, and one person can turn around and say, you know, he's letting criminals loose into your community, and everybody freaks out, and they buy it, and they cramp down, and not only do they not release a thousand people, but then they take away the program and, and ensure that more people are going to stay in there. I'd say that pretty well summarizes it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, we don't. It, it's, it's funny. The public reception. Uh, most people think crime is getting worse. In fact, for the last thirty years or so, it's been getting better. The crime rate goes down every year, um, for reasons that are unclear. Um, 
people think they're in greater danger now of being robbed or assaulted than they were 10 years ago. They're not. They're safer. I know prison very rarely, rarely makes anyone better. It usually makes people worse. Um, the experience is brutalizing often. Um, now, is that going to change? I'm pessimistic. I don't see any groundswell of, of public opinion to, to try to fix the prison system in the United States. Um, when's the last time you heard someone suggesting we close a federal prison? One of the things um, John Howard is involved in is um, a comprehensive review of the uh, um, regulations and job prohibitions for inmates. Um, was it you can't be a, a barber, I think, if you've got certain convictions. Uh, you know, uh, uh, banks won't hire people who have com committed certain offenses, but will hire people who've committed other kinds of offenses. Um, it, it, we've been looking at that on the, on the state level. Actually, we're looking at it on the national level to see how we can improve it on the state level. Um, every time you set up a new rule that says so-and-so can't get a job somewhere because they've been in prison, you make it more likely that they're going to go back. And some of these things really don't make any any sense. I mean, why does having a barber's license, what has that got to do with stealing a car? I mean, if someone stole a car, it's the wrong thing to do. You shouldn't do that. But why can't they go on to be a barber? Um, there's a ban the box movement. You know, are you familiar with that? Yeah, it's okay. a, a, a convicted of a felony. Though. Exactly. Um, the only problem with that is that um, with the internet, it's gotten so easy to find out somebody's record. And in the future, it'll be universal. Everybody's record will be available to everyone. Um, that the band the box, I don't think, is going to give us a. a Do you think that, that transparency um, on balance could be positive for society, or do you think? It because sometimes I'm on the fence. Sometimes I think in the larger picture, the fact that we're getting more transparent means that you know the shadows are slowly eroding, and so you can't really hide as much. But then you also everything that you have is you know is right out there, and it's so easily misinterpreted. And it's so easily inaccurate too. Um, no, I'm I am I have sort of the same opinion that you do. Um, I would check to see if a financial advisor had ever been convicted of financial offenses before I chose that person to help me manage my money. Um, and yet we're hardest on people with drug convictions. Yeah. Well, which, aside from sex offenders. Yeah. So sex offenders are being the most stigmatized element of, of human society. Um, it's almost impossible to find any assistance for a sex offender when I often get calls from family members saying, you know, my brother, so somebody is coming out, he's a convicted sex offender, where can he live? He can't live at my house because I live a block from a daycare center. And my answer is always, can he live in the country? Can he survive living out in the countryside so they'll be far away from a park and school, all the other prohibited places? And the answer is usually no. Um, and the problem with living in the country is you can get some real negative feedback from your neighbors once they find out you're convicted of sex offender. Um, this society has got to come up with a different way of handling people uh, who commit sex offenses. And when you think sex offender, people think of someone who rapes children, okay, which is a terrible offense, okay, it's harshly punished, often with what is effectively a life term, okay. But it's also a 19-year-old girl who has sex with a 17-year-old guy. Well, that's, that's not a sex offense. That's called dating, you know? I mean, that should not be, that person should not be stigmatized as a sex offender. And in some states, she would be. Let's not have too many illusions about this. I know exactly who I'm dealing with. And there are some people who belong in prison. There are some people who should never be let out of prison, OK? It's just the way it is. Um, that said, Yes, there are, there are people who, there are people who want crimes to be committed, okay? I mean, they, they, they will create a crime if necessary, and I'm speaking of the police here. Police have a great deal of discretion in determining whether a crime has occurred or not. Uh, if if um, a, a woman slaps a man, is it domestic abuse? Well, maybe it is, maybe it's not, you know. Uh, domestic abuse is a serious offense now. Um, 
Whether we need a, a criminal class, I don't know, but I think we're going to have one. And it won't always be the same individual. People can change, you know.